final <laughs> on, um, and don't pay attention to the lineup of the bills. I'm going to go in a different order on the bills. But Ed Cutler is welcome to speak about any of the bills. Any of the five bills is our first witness, and um, hopefully it will be brief. And then we can start to mark up the bills. I plan to start with the bill on the shooting contest, go to the F-72, and go to S-22. More than that. Four and a half. Four and a half. And then the other two bills which have to do with the work. Morning, Ed. Okay. Oh. Here's your, is this yours, Peggy? Peggy. Oh, it's on. Okay. So, yes, please start. Hello, everybody. Okay, hi, my name's Ed Cutler. I'm the, uh, here representing the gun owners of Vermont. And we're here to make a final appeal. Um, the Rogers bills are wonderful. And as I said the other night, we support them fully. We are hoping the other bills are voted down in this committee today. Uh, as far as the uh, Senator Baruch bills, and we've also heard and this, I don't know how true it is, but it was in the paper that uh, Senator Rash will be trying to drag him out of this committee, regardless of what the committee does. We're hoping that you stand firm. Well, I can tell you right now, in conversation with Senator Rash, that is absolutely untrue. Okay. He would never do that. There are members of the Senate who might try. Senator Rash would stick with this committee. Okay, excellent. So. And what we're hope, actually, we're hoping that the committee stands firm. Well, there may be member, other members of the Senate who might try to do that, but. Mm -hmm. Well, hopefully it won't happen. <laughs> um, again, um, you've heard lots of testimony. The reason we want the other bills held over, and during the, the first hearings we had when I was here, you asked for a serious study on this type of thing. We can supply uh, Dr. John Lott, who's the, one of the world's foremost authorities on these types of laws. He's willing to come and speak. Um, you probably have to hold it off till next year, but we can get him here within two to three weeks' notice. If you give me notice, I'll get him up here. Um, we hear a lot of rhetoric in this room from different groups, and this guy has done major studies and is willing to be an expert witness. So we're hoping that this could be allowed. I, I, I'm going to just explain why I said no okay. to your request, because it's several emails have questioned why I said no. And I said no because I try to keep things as much as possible to be a Vermont response and not a national response. Mm -hmm. Now that's that's difficult. But if I heard from Dr. Lott, I am sure that Gun Sense or the Gifford Center or some other center would be available to immediately refute anything he said. I would be in a dueling contest between experts, um, which we already are to some extent. Um, and I just, I did the same thing during civil union, and I was highly criticized. I had a group of, there was a guy from out of state, I can't remember his name, he was fairly famous, he had run for U.S. Senate, he was a black individual. Um, Alan Keyes. Alan Keyes. Yeah, Alan, Illinois. Yeah. Illinois. I said no to Alan Keyes. Well, John Bloomer, now Senate Secretary, invited Allen because I said no to have him in the committee. Bloomer, who was a member of the committee, um, invited Allen to come and speak at the pavilion. Well, immediately upon all that happened, um, all the participants from the pavilion then came over here to charge into me for not allowing Allen Keyes to speak. And I said, if you want, I'll find Washington, <coughs> D.C. experts to come up here and tell the other side, and Mr. Keyes can speak, and we'll, we'll have that battle. But tell me what you'll have accomplished. You know, I do look at Harvard studies. I do look at, uh, I actually looked and Googled Mr. Lott, found out, you know, he's, he's got a lot of uh, information. 
that is useful. I also found others on the Glenn Beck show, which didn't impress me much, but that's just my political philosophy. Um, but you know, that's been my policy as chair of this committee from that day forward. And I was highly criticized, as you've, some of you may remember, for not, I think it's even in um, a book about the civil unions um, called The Civil War or something like uh, the guy, uh, David uh, <coughs> Moltz. Anyway, so I've been fairly consistent that, you know, the. So anyway, I just needed to explain that I get that off my chest. It was nothing personal, Ed, and I do appreciate your effort to try to get somebody from the National League. Uh, sure. But I, I know, you know, then we get into dueling experts. OK. A um, couple other things I would also like to mention. Um, there have been a number of things going around. Um, the big thing with us is Vermont has a 230-year history of nonviolence. Occasionally, yes, things happen, but we should all be proud of what this state is and what this state and how it is. We are constantly being bombarded. And again, Phil, no offense, but you were on VPR saying this is a small step and you want to keep going further. Um, this is not going to stop, and I think it's time to draw the line. Um, the people in this state have, are good, decent people. And all I can do is just ask, please, fight to the nail against anything except for John's bills. John's bills are great. They do help with people who are being or could be falsely imprisoned. And uh, there's only one thing I would like to think of is uh, in the future we go further with that. Because people move to this state. If they happen to be competition shooters or hunters or whatever, if they have those high capacity magazines, quote, they won't be able to bring those firearms with them. And those firearms do go back to the 1860s. <laughs> So, there, please. I'll protect you, Dick. Thanks, John. Got my gun right here. It would be great if we could, you know, someday have this thing over time. Jesse James taught me never that. You know how he died. Yeah. It would be good if we could somehow allow those people that want to move into this state to bring their firearms with them. We have hundreds literally, of people in my organization that have moved here because of those gun rights. Right now, Vermont is the standard that 17 other states have followed by going to constitutional carry, a.k.a. Vermont. <coughs> we start losing those rights, and it's not only us that does it, but a lot of people around the nation lose their rights to so. I understand very well your fear that if we take one little step here, it becomes another giant step towards taking away more and more of your, uh, what you see as your constitutional rights, and then it gets to the issue of open carry, it gets to the issue of concealed weapons, it gets to the issue of, you know, all of that. I understand that clearly. I will say about Senator Rogers' bills, I do support all four of his bills. The reason I didn't take up the bill that um, repeals the magazine ban is because it's in the courts right now. And um, as a matter of fact, my, my statement in the journal of last year when I voted no on the magazine ban is part of Max Misch's defense um, against the charges in Bennington for carrying the magazines. Yeah. Um, which surprised me that I was part of that defense. I didn't offer to be part of it, but my statement is, and I'm hoping that they do find it either unconstitutional through the um, effort of, of the lawsuit or through the Max Mish case. Mm -hmm. um, but that's 
my, that's one, that's the reason we didn't take up the repeal of the magazine ban. Yep, I understand that, and I okay. do really appreciate it. And John's done an excellent job, I know sometimes. He got a little mad at me once, but, you know, we do. Well, we all get mad at you once in a while. Later. I think we all get mad at you. I never have. No, actually, you know, I get along better with Phil than anybody else, surprisingly. And Joe. And Alice. And you. Actually, I get along with everybody in this committee. Oh, we had one, and, you know, that was overdone in five minutes. So. Yeah. All right. Well, let's move on. Anything yeah. else? And I understand your concern. I really do. Yeah. Um, and I have not, you know, we'll be working our way through these bills today. As I said, my my hope is that they do find the ban on the magazine ban portion of the S55 unconstitutional. Okay. Un yeah. Unconstitutional. Understood. And Phil. Yes. Would you, we had a really good debate on TV a couple of years ago. Um, would you be willing to do something like that in this building? Well, yes, short answer. Longer answer would be where in the process you would want to do that. Well, anything to be convenient to you. I'm, un I'm not unemployed, I'm retired. So I have any day possible. Um, Why don't you two set that up offline? Okay, <laughs> good, um, good. Okay. Any questions, or? I think I've made comments okay. clear. Um, I will say, I, I, you know, I, one thing I regret about last year on S55 is I got forced to vote. I felt that I needed to vote no, but when I voted no, I lost all control of the situation. Mm -hmm. I had no influence whatsoever on the final outcome. Yep. Um, and, you know, the current makeup of the Senate and the House leads me to believe that uh, that's not going to be any better if I just say no. So that's been weighing heavily on my mind, uh, frankly. All right, thank you. Okay, and thank you for having me. All right, Eric, do you want to join us? And yep. maybe we could start with the with Senator. I, I want to do the order of S, I think it's S1. That repeat uh, that um, would um, allow the shooting contest. It seems to me that that's a, that's an unfortunate byproduct that I think most people agree was a mistake to uh, end the ability of the shooting contest to have large magazines. So if we could start with that bill and then work to S72 and then S22. The other two, I, I think, may need a little revision, but I don't think are necessarily all that controversial. Thank you. So did you say S1 center shares? Yes, I think it's S1. Yeah. By the way, I've got all these phone calls that have been, they're all to me and the committee, so you want to look at me. Sure. Yeah, you can for a minute. You can pass the bell. Do you have? Yep. So, S1 that I have just is the repeal, mm -hmm. but it doesn't show what, what we're repealing. I handed out earlier when we when I first went through the bill yep. an actual yep. copy of the section. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so what should the first S1? I'm just trying to find uh, a yeah. copy of the Vermont statute. Okay. You've got it there. Uh, it looks like this. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, no, it's 4021. It's the next one. It's right under that one. You got it right there. Yeah. So, so, I think you got it. Yep. Yeah. Okay. 4021, do you have that one? Yeah. Yep. So, Senator Sears, uh, as you mentioned earlier, this has to do with the. Uh, statute that you passed last year regarding large capacity ammunition feeding devices uh, that was passed in Act 94 this year, the prohibition on that contained, you remember, a number of exceptions, <coughs> quite a lengthy list of them. And if you're able to sort of track down the handout that I passed out the first time we looked at S1, which yeah, is right. the actual copy of We're going to be able to find that. Right. I don't know. Uh, I've, got, I've got the 419, 419. Right. But not. 
Uh, well, I can just read this. It's, well, it's why don't short. you just well, yeah. go through it? I'll, we'll keep trying to track it. I would like to have it in front of me. Okay. Sorry. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. By any chance, people going out make a few copies? Does somebody have one and I can. Yeah. What's the title there? Uh, it says on top, uh, Vermont Statutes Online, Title 13, Criminal Procedures, oh, Section 4021, Large Capacity Ammunition. Oh, we have your spare. No, no. <laughs> you probably have mine. That's the others. That's what happened. I have, uh, <laughs> you have two statutes there. That one. one is 4019 and one is 4021. 21, I have both of them. All right. And, well, and here's another, an extra 419. Well, we're really proud of you guys. I already have No, Alice is the one that's on the phone. <laughs> I know you should be proud of it, but for other reasons. Oh my God. Got it. Go ahead, Eric. I, I mean, yeah. yeah. It's hard here to. We don't have staff to. Well, you remember sort of conceptually that that when uh, <laughs> the large capacity ammunition feeding device prohibition was passed, there were a yeah. number of exceptions, and that there were right. one the ex particular exception that S one deals with. Um, whether or not you have a copy in front of you. I'll read the language, it's brief. But what it says is that uh, this section shall not apply, remember, so that's a sort of, sort of your laundry list of exceptions, to any large capacity ammunition feeding device. And we move on to this particular one. I'll just read you the language. Transported by a resident of another state into this state for the exclusive purpose of use in an established shooting competition if the device is lawfully possessed under the laws of another state. So, mm -hmm. the first point about that is that it only applies if um, it's transported by a, a resident of another state into the state of Vermont. Remember that? And the yeah. whole idea was the shooting competition subject that was discussed, I think, fairly uh, at length, and the impact that the prohibition might have on these shooting contests. So this exception was carved out, so that if other if residents of other states were coming into Vermont for the exclusive purpose of these shooting competitions, then they could still um, bring their large capacity ammunition feeding devices in. However, uh, in a separate section of that bill, you remember that exception was sunset. Yep. Everybody remember that? So now if you look at S1, now look, look at S1 itself. Yep. You see, it, there's a reference to the, re, the sunset section in the parenthesis on line 14 and 15. That exception only lasted until July 1st, 2019. Right. Remember, that was sunset. Yep. And um, so that's the background. That's the right. state of the law as it is. What does uh, S1 propose to do? Repeal the sunset. Mm -hmm. As that approach has been done in other legislative solidness so that the ability of out-of-state residents to transport the feeding devices into Vermont for purposes of the shooting competitions uh, would remain permanent. And I'm, I, I, I mean, if I remember back to our original discussion on the Senate floor, this was an area where we tried, I think we had almost unanimous support to change this, but because they didn't want to have a conference committee or they didn't want to have to go back and have another House vote, they didn't allow any changes. And that was one of the points where I made about losing control of the debate. Um, Actually, I don't think it passed. Uh, I think it yeah. would have if it had been by itself. It oh, was I see. part of a, a larger I see. thing that would have basically okay. um, taken the ban out. Um, on high feeding devices. Because so. I didn't vote for this one. Yeah. Anyway, um, okay. I move we um, insert into what well, the plan is to create a committee bill, whether we end up with five votes or one vote or whatever we end up is to have a committee bill and not have the numbers. So I would move that part, the first part, section one of the committee bill, be the repeal of the sunset on the shooting contest. Can I ask a question? Sure, Eric? of course. Eric, my, uh, so it seems clear to me that it's referring to residents of another state. Right. Um, and my assumption is to go back to Eddie's point, um, 
if someone moves here, this no longer applies to them. In other words, no, that they're a resident of Vermont. Yeah, so they, they come for a sporting competition and they stay because they love it so much. <laughs> right. Um, they're now a resident of Vermont and no longer covered by the exception. That's the way I read it. Right. Okay. Um, then my other question is just about the word established. If you could just say something about what, what you understand the word established to be doing there. Uh, I think the the intent back when uh, when that language was passed was that uh, there be um, that the SUNY competitions to which it referred to would be already in existence. I think at the time of the of the uh, of the grandfathering, so to speak, or the exception, so that. Uh, you know, there. I think that if I remember the discussion correctly. One of the concerns was that, in fact, some competitions had already signed people up back then, and they were already already, already planned to be in existence. So I, I think that was the idea, if I remember right. Is that the understanding of the committee? You know, my my preference would be to allow the Hill Mountain Fish Game Club, which currently, in my knowledge, doesn't have a contest to have one, as long as it's a recognized. <clears throat> Well, I guess that's what I'm asking. Yeah, my, from my perspective, my motion was to allow shooting contests and to only, you know, I mean, it sort of goes back to our exemption for outdoor recreation and the unconscionable terms bill that, that you know, as long as they're, um, you know, have the waivers and all that stuff. I, I don't, you know, I, I, I just would hate to say, okay, it's only established ones. And then I find out the Hale Mountain Fishing Game Club wants to hold a shooting contest because they haven't had one before. And frankly, I don't know if they've had them or not. But um, they've been, you know, been in existence for a hundred years probably, and to lose the ability to have one of these shooting contests. So certainly there are. I mean, the, the Weathersfield Rod and Gun Club has has had some contests like this every year. But they, yeah. And so But they would be covered, but I'm worried about the ones would they, that wouldn't be. Why would they, they be covered? Established. They'd be covered because they've established well, they they're already established. They may not have set up the date for that contest. You know, they well, I, organize at one at a meeting that they haven't set it up. So well, the intent is that to have it not <clears throat> unless Senator Bruce has got an objection, my intent of my motion was to allow them. <clears throat> Could I ask a question? Right. Yeah. If I I don't like the idea of just of it just applying to ones that have been already established. But I wondered is, when there are shooting competitions, do do would your group somehow get a permit from somebody to have a so I can't have a shooting competition in my backyard? Um, I mean, is is there a some kind of a an authorized shooting competition or sanction. I'm going to ask Chris Bradley from the Vermont okay. Federation of Sportsmen okay. Clubs if he's or if somebody else from that federation can answer that question. One of the hats I wear is past president of the Vermont State Rifle and Pistol Association, and I'm current secretary treasurer. Um, we have all sorts of CMP and NRA registered events, and they're typically sanctioned by the NRA or CMP. We give them notice ahead of time. So they can advertise these events. Um, so when we have somebody coming in from out of state, it would be a very rare occurrence that they would travel that distance without first of obtaining, at least for the Vermont State Rifle and Pistol, a, uh, a recognition that they are signed up. But my the question term sanctioned event was in there. Yeah, I, I would be. Yeah, my, that would cover my, so Senator White could sign up. I can't set one up. If, if we repealed this and took out the word established. And put it in sanction. I, I wouldn't, it wouldn't cover, it wouldn't allow me to set up a competition in my backyard and invite all my neighbors. Um, I, I, I mean, it's some, somehow they're, they are uh, sanctioned or they're uh, sponsored. I think the word sanctioned is about. I, I, would, I, I would offer caution. Um, okay. quite, okay. Simply, um, we provide NRA and CMP sanctioned and registered events. Um, for a fun private, and we predominantly use Camp Ethan Allen training site, which is a, a facility designed as, for ranges. So if we were to have uh, a practice uh, in preparation the weekend before a state match, is that a sanctioned 
event, or is it a practice that, and would that stop somebody from? Looking for a word that other than established, because established would mean you could never have a new one. Organized? Uh, yeah, I was going to suggest organized. Also, Eric may answer the question, uh, there is, uh, isn't there not a statutory description of a shooting range in another statute? Uh, yes. I, I don't know. Could be referenced? Yeah, so you could only have them at, at shooting ranges? I don't know where else you'd have them. Well, I, I think yeah, your example was could you have one in the right. yeah. field? Um, but if you stick with the existing statute, I think you can clarify that quite easily. Did you have wrong here? Evan? Uh, I'm not sure the answer to that. Mm -hmm. Okay. First off, there is a definition of a range. It's in Title 10, right. seven, Title 10, yeah, Section 5. Okay. <clears throat> also, the, the, uh, the language of non resident, uh, UVM has, a, has matches. And you could have a Vermont resident who was attending a college in another state and now wants to come back into UVM at the UVM competition. Mr. Should. Chair? Yeah. So uh, I would um, not be able to support this if, if we're contemplating changing it to Vermont residents because you're just, at that point, you're, you're undermining the ban itself. I would be able to support it if we swapped out the word established for sanction. I think you should just repeat it. So let me ask a question about that. Yes. So if we, we're, we're saying that, that an out of state, if somebody can come up from Massachusetts with a uh, magazine yes. for a shooting competition and participate in it, but my neighbor can't go to one because he can't. Because we That's have a ridiculous. Band well, in that case, I would say let's get, let's not repeal the sunset. Or let's just repeal the ban. Well, that's that's my point. If if what you want to do is if you want to anyway. tweak the, uh, the the what we passed last year and and allow this to go forward, this piece of law, I can support that. But in effect, we'd be rewriting it to weaken the ban if we mm -hmm. if we. Well, why don't we just repeal the ban? I thought you said that you were not doing that. Well, I wasn't planning to, but. If we're going to get into such a debate about how we're going to define an existing shooting contest, I might. My number one goal here is to yeah. um, allow established shooting contests to continue to go on past July 1st of 2019. So, if the only way we can get some um, consensus is to repeal the ban, then we don't have to worry about whether it's a Vermont resident, a New Hampshire resident, or any other resident. So moved. Hmm. There you go. <laughs> All right. Well, and let me explain. I don't think Vermonters should be placed at a disadvantage to out of staters. It's that simple. Yeah. Which is what we're doing. Exactly. Well, I I can't support, and from the beginning, I've been clear. I can't support anything that weakens fundamentally the ban that we passed last year. I can support getting rid of the sunset. I swapped out established for sanctioned. In fact, John and I had a conversation yesterday where sanctioned was his suggestion. So, um, but if the committee is gonna go down the road of essentially undoing the ban for Vermont residents, I can't see that passing the Senate, can't see it passing the House, uh, and I certainly can't vote. But I don't understand why we would want to put Vermont residents at a, at a disadvantage. I don't view it as putting them at, at a disadvantage. If it were up to me, I would say that I no would one can prefer to have the line. Then, okay. then, if you would prefer not to repeal the ban today, then the language needs to read that for the purposes of shooting contest, one may possess a high capacity magazine, whether you're from Vermont or New Jersey or Alaska. And that you can only Why should it be restricted to, I mean, for the purposes yeah. of that, if, you know, the, the National Golf Association makes certain rules, but I'm not playing at a, you know, in a right. local tournament. I'm not obliged to follow those rules. I follow local rules. So one day the, the, uh, the superintendent decides you can play the ball, lift and clean and place the ball. So we play under those rules. Those are not rules that are sanctioned by the PGA. But 
we all play under the same rule. And the way you're trying to make it, the Vermonters would be at a disadvantage. It's not the way I'm trying to make it, it's the way the law currently Well, this, the yeah. law was stupid. And <laughs> uh, frankly, Phil, that, that ban came out of the House with yeah. no debate and never got discussed in any committee of the Senate. Right. And I, I find it the most objectionable thing that happened in S-55 because the Senate never got the opportunity. Now you're defending it as if it was part of a Senate bill. It never was. I, it I'm never got debated in the Senate. I'm defending it. It did get debated in the Senate. Where? And we went. <laughs> Everything we passed was under debate. Yeah, but it wasn't allowed to be <clears throat> changed because you had the votes to not change it. And, you, you, well, you, it was and, and what happened was the you know, I, I still have it, it nightmares be, about what happened. It there. would be allowed to be changed okay. if you had the vote. I'm, I'm going to suggest then as an alternative <clears throat> that we allow Vermont or that for the purposes of shooting contests, we don't specify out of state, in state. We just say anybody who participates may possess a, hand, a large capacity magazine for the purposes of the shooting contest. That gets around us you know, repealing the ban. No, it doesn't. It, it, it undoes the ban for a Vermont How resident. Does it, yeah, but it's unfair to a Vermont resident who doesn't, who may want to, you go to the shooting contest, they supply you with a, with a uh, magazine and you use it at the shooting contest. It doesn't allow you to possess it outside because you never owned it before the grandfathering. I'm, I, I can't repeat what I've said. I, I, okay. Um, yeah. My motion would be that we repeal the ban on shooting contests, but stop the language about out of state and state that the magazines be supplied by the sponsor of them. That they can bring, they can use them for the purposes of that. For the purposes of the show. Meaning any, anyone in state or out of state? Yeah, why should, use them. why should a Vermont resident who wants to participate be held at a disadvantage? Well, I, my motion then would be to stick with current law because I, I was trying to, excuse me, John. Yeah. Yes, sir, what's your point of There's a motion on the floor at the moment. And we're discussing it. So I amended your motion. And I believe I have the right to discuss the motion. You have a right to discuss the motion. Oh, I thought you were so, making another motion. I, I no, heard so my second motions and third motions, so yeah. I'm trying to figure I out. I think your motion would be order. out of order. Um, but I could get yeah. the Senate Secretary down to determine. Well, all, all I'm. <clears throat> point all, of order wise, for yeah. the purpose of clarifying and trying to get this conversation more concise, I will remove my motion and allow you to make yours. Okay, my motion is. <clears throat> Allow any participant to possess for only that shooting contest to possess a high capacity magazine. And by way of discussion, I will say I, I can't support that and I can't support a bill that's got that in it. What I what I will say is I was prepared to support John's bills as they have been presented to us. This is a fundamental change that undermines the case at law, which your guiding principle was you weren't going to do that. No, it doesn't undermine the case at law okay. because it allows it allow it would be written so that it only allows the participant to use it, mm -hmm. whether they're a Vermont or New Hampshire resident or whatever. Then I then I would repeat something Joe said at the hearing the other day. If that's in, I regard that as weakening S fifty five and I will fight it as it moves out of this committee. Okay. So I just have a question of how that would work. When you say allowed to use it there, can they possess it at home and bring it there? Well, if it's grandfathered, they or, still or can't you, purchase it. Or are you suggesting that there be ammunition, high capacity ammunition well, there, there be, provided by the club or whatever to use it? Is, I'm not sure which is. I don't know how they'll work it out. <clears throat> I'm not sure what's going on there. Well, the big well I'm not is, sure either. <clears throat> can they take it home? I mean, can they have it at home and bring it? No, they still can't purchase it. <clears throat> It doesn't allow any purchase. Right, okay, yeah. It allows them to use it. To use it. How they get it, maybe they borrow, you know. I don't know how they get it. So are you maybe saying, maybe Senator Sears, that, that uh, it only applies to people who have already 
-mm. who are grandfathered properly? No. No. If they if they go to the to the contest and they're supplied with a high capacity magazine, they can use it at the contest. They still can't. <coughs> When you go to a bowling contest, a lot of people don't bring their own balls. But you see what we're talking they about have, They use the balls that are there. So. Various situations where, under the so-called ban, it will be fine for people to begin using, possessing, et cetera, and we will very quickly weaken that ban. At competitions yeah. only. Well, and as Alice points out, you can uh, have them at home. No, she. He yes. said. Well, there are people. Home. There are. That was a question. Grand, grand, the law that you mm -hmm. you pushed yeah. grandfathered them. But so, I thought the question was just asked if it only applied to grandfathered weapons, and the answer was no. And then her question was, are they going to be maybe supplied by the competition? That right. was her second question, and and my response to that is that's probably the maybe. way they should do it. Well, is that I, the competition yeah. itself supplies It's not up to them. me to figure out how they get the bowling ball. I would just point out that when this law was passed, there was a <coughs> short period before it went into effect, and an outside interest gave out high-capacity magazines on the steps of the yeah. statehouse. Mm -hmm. yeah. So there was a very ready... You know it was effective October... The, ma yeah. the magazine ban was effective October 1st of last year and not July 1 like other parts of the bill. I'm just saying that, that there was an active attempt to undermine mm -hmm. well, the, the ban. Yeah, but that's because you, you, not you, Phil Baruth, but the supporters of the bill who wrote that in, wrote in for whatever reason, well, I wasn't a part of, wrote in October 1st. So it was completely legal that they gave them away. They might have been trying to undermine the ban, and you may look at it that way. But what they were doing was completely legal because you yes. put that into the law. And, and my point is, if we change this existing provision to include Vermonters, it now specifically says it only applies to out-of-state mm -hmm. residents. Yep. If we change it to Vermonters, there will be a proliferation of circumstances where it's okay for people to have and use high-capacity That's for the magazines. purposes of the shooting contest yep. only. But suppose somebody goes to another state, buys one, brings it in for purposes of using in a shooting contest. Then they violated the law. I, I don't believe they would. They it, violated an un unenforceable law. I don't, I don't believe they, they would. They violated an unenforceable law unless you're stupid enough to buy them with a photo at the wherever Max bought his, or his girlfriend bought him, actually. But, I, 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 was so I, I mean, that's, that can go on today. You go out, you go to New Hampshire, and if they don't have a, a recording, a video recording, if you buy in the high capacity magazine and you bring it back in, how do you enforce that I, today? Without, I, without, how do you know that that magazine wasn't possessed prior to October 1st, 2018? I would just like the record to show that I'm in support of yeah. S1, as written okay. by John Rogers. Okay. And uh, so I'm going to say that I, um, I support it also, but I'm not. But I don't think that it's right to give, to have Vermonters at a disadvantage in a shooting contest because I, I don't, I mean, I don't know people who participate necessarily in shooting contests, but if, if I wanted to, I would be a little bit upset if I wasn't allowed the same, the same um, advantage that somebody from out of state. And I have to say that I, I voted for that last year, but I voted for it because it was part of a larger bill that I supported. I did not support the the ban on the and because I I heard things like um, if you're intent on doing harm, it's easier to bring in three or four ten round um, magazines in your pockets than it is. A 30 round that you have to is bigger and you have to it's harder to hide so I mean there were many reasons why I didn't support the ban in the first place so so given the fact that we have a ban and we can maybe make it um, more more fair for Vermonters I support Dick's okay, um, do you, do you have it written down Harry? well I think the question is Two ways I'm thinking based on the sort of two thoughts I've heard the committee discussing, and it's a policy decision for you which way you want to go. 
you could phrase it as possessed for the exclusive purpose of use and in, in a sanction maybe is the way we were going or possibly or sanction or established shooting competition period if you wanted you could also say so that was one thought that sort of raised a question that Senator Nick and a couple others have talked about. Well, what if, what if you're possessing it at a time when the shooting competition is not going on? Did you want to limit it? Because you could also yes. say possessed and, possessed and used at yeah. an established shooting competition. The shooting contest. Mm -hmm. are, we, are we talking about the grandfathered magazines only? No. 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 Okay. Then uh, I don't understand how anybody can view it other than a, a weakening of the ban because you're contemplating Vermont residents now having a class of of high capacity magazines that were not grandfathered that will be legal. They don't own them. They're not purchased. They they would be using them at the shooting contest. Maybe the the range has a bunch of them that they already have. I don't know. Yeah. I think we still, still can't purchase. Them. I, that's not they what I hear you said. Yeah, yeah possess sure. you can't that's purchase them. Okay, I, I said you can bring your grandfathered one, or if you can, if there's one available to for you to use, I might use John's. If I'm at the shooting contest and John's got one, and I use his, I don't. I didn't purchase it. I'm using it exclusively during the contest. All right. If you phrase it that way. Right. I think you, you would then, if you say possessed at and used at an established shooting competition, and I think as long as it, you were it doesn't mean that you couldn't do one that wasn't years ago. You mean that had it was sort of ongoing? I mean, it, when, but, that the Hale Mountain Fish and Game Club hadn't had one in the last 10 years and they want to do one next year. So as long as they're not eliminated from being able to do yeah. that. So, under um, possibly a, a resolution to this, if I'm understanding it right. So, are you saying that the that the, the clubs are offering people grandfathered magazines, or they could purchase well, new a whole bunch? I don't know how they would maybe people that have got a grandfathered magazine to loan them to the club for the purposes that if, day. Because if if we're talking about the grandfathered magazines, which would be easy for Eric to reference. So in other words, um, there's a provision that grandfathers and you could refer to that section. If those are the magazines that we're talking about, then it doesn't matter to me yeah. if they use them at a... Well, somehow the club has the magazines, or I borrow John's and I use it exclusively. I don't own them currently, okay? But I want to go to this contest. And if I use John's during the contest, yep. I could do that because John's is grandfathered, no, yes. but only during the, yeah, if you don't confuse it. No, me. I won't. So uh, currently under the law, if I hand Dick my 30 round magazine, yeah. that is considered a transfer and is illegal. So yeah. even if we're at the competition, I cannot lend him my magazine or my rifle. And, and I would be fine with, um, if it's limited to grandfathered magazines, and if it's at the competition, yeah. yes. I'm not purchasing and I'm not possessing it. Okay. I'm usually only using it during the- I, I understood people to be saying- So, so Eric, do you have enough sense of the committee's position? Yes. Are we saying sanctioned, right? I think the word That's sanctioned the word. is fine. Yeah. Yes, don't confuse it. <laughs> now, one other thing, though. I don't intend to. Well, one one no. other thing is, uh, do you want to do you want to keep the because uh, <coughs> the the ability of the transport of the state for the shooting competition is a different concept? Yeah, yeah. so that, uh, that concept stays like it was in the in the prior language that got repealed or is repealed July one. Yes. So, so that, that for the purposes of the shooting contest, if you live in New Hampshire, you can bring the high capacity magazine gotcha. and just for the purpose of that. Yep. Bill, you were coming. Bill Moore, Vermont Tradition Coalition. Uh, our club's current uh, events are not sanctioned by a national organization. They're sanctioned by the club, but the club are, sanctioned what, by the club. organized is a much better term organized, and yeah. a reference to the shooting ranges in statute, which I just offered to Eric, well, would clarify that. Okay. Yeah. Instead of sanctioned, use the term organized. organized. 
Okay. Can we reference the shooting range? I think that's yeah, a good idea. It's yeah. defined in statute already. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, wherever that is in statute. Yeah. Yeah. So that we avoid yeah. Senator White's. Yeah, example. we don't want her holding one of her. <laughs> but you don't. Definitely don't. She's got a big backyard, but you got a lot of pigs and dogs in that backyard. Well, that might be a solution to the pig problem. <laughs> 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 Uh, I think our neighbor has eaten his pig now. It's <laughs> eaten over at Curtis's. Uh, Twelve, Curtis's, uh, Twelve Curtis times Curtis's last barbecue. spring. Curtis's uh, uh, truck is bar. barbecue. <laughs> Curtis's barbecue yeah. is right in her backyard, <laughs> and he has to get pigs in order to have the barbecue. <laughs> oh no, he wasn't. This wasn't a barbecue pig. All right, so um, <laughs> we know the motion. Peggy, could you please call the roll? Um, I'd rather not vote until we see the language, if you don't mind. Okay. All right. Moving right along, F72. F72 is next. So this one I actually have an amendment to look at because remember we talked about there was an issue that Judge Grierson brought up mm -hmm. regarding the uh, ability of the court to access certain kinds of data. So uh -huh. to sort of tweak the language on that a little bit. Yep. Mm -hmm. Uh, oh, this is a redraft. Yeah, I just handed it out. I'm sorry. Okay. Do you want to yep. add that to Peggy? Thank you. So it's still a May? Yes, still a May. Um, healthcare provider may notify the law enforcement officer, so it's, and, uh, it's May under HIPAA as well. I think that's necessary. Uh, again, that's language that tracks HIPAA. Oh. Yeah. And is consistent with the exception in HIPAA for the disclosure of protected health information by health care providers. Section two is where the change is. This is the reporting piece, the, uh, the piece where the court and the um, Agency of Human Services is supposed to come up with data on the use of extremist protection orders as well as a possible impact on suicides in Vermont. You remember, Judge, and this is, if you look at the bottom of page two over onto the top of page three, Judge Grierson was pointing out that they didn't really have the ability to track mm -hmm. what happened to the subject of the petition afterward, you know, where they referred to mental health counseling, that sort of thing. Um, so instead, I replaced that with, you know, there's at least sort of a, a maybe another way you could get at it, because they do have the ability within the ERPO chapter to note whether an order was renewed or terminated, so that would at least tell you whether or not the person is still subject to the order or not. As well as uh, I noticed that uh, there's a particular criminal charge within the chapter for violating the order. That would also be useful to know. It sort of tells you what sort of some information about the person. Dr. Versati is just trying to gather information. It's not just him, but the, or the organization that he's current, I believe, current pro president or past president. <coughs> is made of emergency room docs from a number of states which have passed Europos. And they're trying to gather the information like that we used from Connecticut last year so that we can see what the impact has been. And I think this is fine. Yeah. So, so the issue, of course, comes up with regard to a dangerous weapon and yeah. how this might be amended by other people. Well, I'm assuming it means you know, I, mean, I want to make a statement about that. <coughs> and I, we can wait till later on, but this, yeah. this language is part of the bill S-241 that we passed last year and the governor signed, mm -hmm. the language of weapon. And we expanded it from firearm to weapon <coughs> because we wanted to make sure if somebody had a stick of dynamite right. or a hand grenade or any other form of, mm -hmm. of incendiary <coughs> I think the terms incendiary device that it would be covered because if you think about when somebody is in that position, you don't want you don't want to take away their firearms and find out they got a bunch of hand grenades. Right, I, I agree with that. So that's the term weapon. You're correct. Anything we do here, whether it's just a simple thing that we just tentatively approved mm -hmm. until we see what Eric's got, or this will invite mm -hmm. amendments. Yeah. I have spent a great deal of time talking to Senator Ash, as well as Senator <clears throat> Representative Grad, mm -hmm. a 
about my concern that if we do anything, what will they do to it? And, I'm, and while I've been assured by both that it's not their intent to go any further than, than this, um, both have admitted that you can't control what might happen on the House floor or the Senate floor. Mm -hmm. But I also have commitment from Senator Ash that he will stick with the committee, whatever the committee does. And if we find ourselves in a position, we will have the votes, I believe, to bring the bill back to committee or to control the conference committee. So I am less worried as long as I vote for the bill that something that we don't anticipate will happen like it did last year. I think that it was partly got out of control. I'm going to use the word out of control. I know a lot, a lot of people thought it was a great bill, so with all due respect to all of them. We all admit that things got added on that we never anticipated being added on to a bill that we passed last year that I thought was just going to be about waiting periods. And, you know, in hindsight, um, many people would have, part of the reason that it got out of control of this committee is because this committee had voted no on the bill. And this committee, you know, you know we had, we, oh, I, I have done my best to be assured that if we pass out the bill and if it's just these two things, and we'll see where it goes on other things, but if it's just two, these two things, that the committee process will be abided by us. I just, I, I take all those points and I think it was well said. I just want to say, in contrast to what I said a few minutes ago, my hope is very much to vote for what we do today and then to defend it on the Senate floor and all the way through the process, i.e. defend it from things being added to it. So as a member of this committee, I want to I want to reach agreement and then I want to protect that agreement. Thank you. Yeah. I mean I would certainly vote to approve this bill by amending it and like the bill. But I don't have confidence in the system anymore after what happened on the floor of the House last year. Some of those things that came up there, if it had been done in committee, I think there could have been some meeting of the minds with all the groups I if it had been done in the committee, and we wouldn't be in any of these positions today. I agree. Therefore, I don't trust the system anymore. Okay. Can I ask a procedural I, question? That's a major <clears throat> statement by a long-term senator and representative. Alice, I respect you deeply as the vice chair. I, understand where you're coming from. I'm trying to add to the bill, so you may wish to vote for certain things that go into the bill and then vote against the bill as it is. That's right. Okay. Okay. That was my procedural question. Yeah. We're not voting on We're not voting on the bill. We're, We're voting, voting on where to add the provisions of that 72 to a committee bill, okay. which may have three votes. Uh, but if it doesn't have three votes, it won't go. But assuming it gets three votes or four or five votes, and it would be a committee bill. So we're not voting on this bill per se. We're voting to put this as part of the committee bill. I move that as, that as amended. S uh, 72 as amended be put, be approved to put into whatever okay. we come up with. That was a, yeah, really. Is there any further discussion on that? Anybody in the audience who likes would like to comment on that? All right, Peggy, could you call the roll on this? Senator White? Yes. Senator Brewer? Yes. Senator Benny? Yes. Senator Nicker? Yes. Senator Sears? Yes. Two down. Yeah, that brings us to S22. And are, I, are you do, are like doing to, the 2 and 13? Uh, later. Oh, okay. They're, they're more. Okay. I, uh, as I said, uh, my comments from last year when I voted no on the bill, the bill? at 55, part of oh, yeah. uh, the defense for Max Mish. So I'd like to read those comments again. I'm going to make a motion in the name. But I said, Mr. President, it's unfortunate that I'm forced to vote no on a bill that I reported and sponsored. When I've looked at a firearms restrictions, I've been guided by one principle. Will the proposed legislation keep firearms out of the hands of individuals who should not possess them? 
whether the law enforcement officers, our attorney general, and our state's attorney, attorneys tell us that something's unenforceable, we should listen. Yes, most Vermonters are law-abiding and will follow the law, so I ask who is this legislation designed for to impact, and this is particularly to the magazine restrictions. Law-abiding citizens or the criminal element and deranged individuals who will not abide by the laws for that reason, I cannot support the sections that deal with the magazines. So that was my statement back then, and I've tried to remain true to that idea that Vermont's problem with firearms is suicide. You know, every report that I've received, everything I've looked at, says that 90% of the fire of the firearm-related deaths in Vermont, might be 89%, are the result of suicide. The others are mainly domestic violence-related. So those have been two areas that we as a committee have tried to deal with over the years. Um, someone said during the debate on the bill, one family, one of the witnesses at our public hearing said, one family's tragedy should not set policy for everyone. And I absolutely agree with that. The, the, the tragedy that the black family suffered in losing their son is something that no parents should ever have to go through. But that should not guide our decision here. It should guide our decision or facts. And the facts that I looked at, when I looked at different studies, said of suicides, 24% of the survivors of suicide in the Houston study, 24% said that their decision was made in less than five minutes. 24% five, said five to 19 minutes. 23% said 20 minutes to one hour, and 16% said two to eight hours, 13% said one or more days. So I looked at that um, factors, and I looked at, um, actually, unfortunately, it came from a firearm dude, but he said the 48-hour waiting period, this is also not, he talked about the secure storage, and I would put that in the category of magazines, an unenforceable law, when we already have the laws. And I appreciate that you decided to drop the secure storage part, but I would argue that's the same as magazines, it's unenforceable. And um, there are laws on the books to deal with neglecting your child or allowing your child to do something unsafe. Anyway, he said that this is also not necessarily and it severely impacts my, my and every other gun dealer's ability to conduct business. And this is the key phrase, and unfortunately, he said it. Many of our sales are impulse buys. And of course, we do have the sale of a specifically selected firearm, and our customers are from out of town. A 48 hour waiting period pretty much puts an end to the impulse buy. So I, you know, I, I realized he was trying to tell me not to vote for the bill. But the same token, he's saying that many of his sales are impulse buys. Then he, then uh, we had Rebecca Bell's testimony, which struck me particularly. Um, suicide and suicidal is complex, and what experts know about suicide deaths runs counterintuitive to what the general public believes to be true. The inevitability myth that such a person with suicidal ideation will just find a way is particularly damaging. 90% of those, those who survive near lethal suicide attempts do not go on later to die by suicide. Many people who die by suicide have not had a prior attempt. The outcome of suicide death is most strongly predicated on the lethality of the method used, not on the history of depression or other mental illness. The lethality of method is determined by inherent deadliness, accessibility, ease of use, and the ability to abort, abort mind attempt. The choice of firearm does not leave room for the regret and remorse that I see in my patients who've chosen other methods and survived. One study looked at 30 people who survived self-inflicted gunshot wounds, and more than half reported having suicidal thoughts for less than 24 hours. More than half had experienced interpersonal conflict within the 24 hours before the attempt. None had written suicide. 
Um, and so I would argue that, uh, number one, I would propose that we amend S-22 for the purposes of our bill to a waiting period of up to 20, of 24 hours and limit it to the sale of handguns. So it would be a one-day waiting period and limit it to the sale of handguns. The reasons for that, in my opinion, are, and we can discuss the of my proposal, but the reasons are several. One is that most often a person in a suicide attempt will use a handgun, not a rifle. I realize some famous people have used rifles, like Ernest Hemingway, but that's somewhat odd. Um, and I don't think that 48 hours, I think, I'm not sure that 48 hours is, does anything that 24 wouldn't do. If it's an impulse buy, then uh, I'm willing to compromise and go to that level if there's two other votes to do that here. Um, I'm not willing to go with 48 hours. I'm not willing to go to all firearms. Um, and part of the reason I'm doing that is, again, as I said earlier, to have some control over this process. I lost complete control of the process last time. And, for me to go, and I've done two things that would probably upset the firearms community, um, my friends, and the Federation of Sportsmen Clubs and other groups in my career. One was introducing the so-called extreme risk protection order bill, and, the, um, and this particular thing. I've always been a strong supporter of um, folks. So, uh, with that said, and I realize this will anger many of my constituents, I also have a lot of constituents who've asked me to vote for S-72 and S-22, a lot of them. And uh, I bet a lot of them asked me to vote no on them, too. So, I think this is in the spirit of what we do around here, it's called compromise. Um, and if I can get the the shooting contest back, and what I will call Dr. Bassardi's bill, I'm willing to move a little bit on waiting period. Because I do think that they will ultimately um, help, I mean, not dramatically, but help with our problem of suicides. And also, to some extent, homicides, because some of the <coughs> homicides occur in a very quick manner without a lot of thought because you're upset with your stuff. Most homicides in Vermont are done by people who know each other and they're usually domestic violence related, as I said earlier. I mean, a lot of them are on impulse as well. So that's my proposal. Um, I realize it's not going to be popular with many people. It might not be popular with anyone because those who wanted a 48 hour waiting period might not be happy with it, but it's, it's all compromise. And if I could speak to what you just said. Um, first of all, I, I greatly appreciate the willingness to, to be flexible and try to reach compromise. And I, I feel the same way. These are very tough issues. Um, I represent a lot of people who have pressed me very hard to um, address suicide by firearm, which is a real problem in Vermont compared to other states. So um, personally, I, I wrote the bill with 48 hours because I believe that would be more effective. I wrote it with all firearms because I believed it would be more effective. But if the committee can land on <coughs> one day handguns, I do believe that would be an appropriate response to what's going on in terms of what some people have called the quiet epidemic of suicide by firearm. So, I can vote for that, and I appreciate the chair's willingness to uh, to try to reach compromise. So that was going to be my question: was why was 48 hours chosen to begin with? Because I think the House bill is 72 yeah. hours, and there were 
there have been different time periods. Yeah. So I, I just was curious as to honestly the the <coughs> the issue is usually usually talked about in terms of one day, two days, or three days. Mm -hmm. And I picked two days two because months. it seemed to me to be a reasonable um, stretch for both of those sides of the argument. I, I think if I understand the chair's um, thinking too, um, is there any greater benefit with the second day? You gave a statistic that put, placed things within a 24 hour period for the most part. Um, I, again, okay. I, I will have to answer to people who no. wanted more than that, but. Um, <coughs> We'll all have to answer yes. to people on both sides. I have to answer to people who want less. Yeah. So. Okay, that's what we do, right? Yeah. On everything. <laughs> I know you feel like it came out of left field, but I'm giving a lot of thought to this. No, no, I, I, so. uh, I understand it. Well, it came out of left field. I was trying to struggle with it. I, I appreciate the fact that you're trying to reach compromise. That is very important. Um, I have a couple of concerns. We have a constitutional provision says we have the right to self-defense. And the very same handgun that you're talking about that may be a direct threat in suicide situations. <clears throat> I don't think the science is settled on that question yet because we've received statistics from both sides that lead me to believe we could at least have a study to determine whether that's a factual problem in Vermont or not. And we don't have that study here in Vermont to determine that. We have one anecdotal situation that led us to have this conversation to begin with. And while I am very sympathetic to those folks, I also have two close friends who committed suicide with handguns. The bottom line is that very same device is also the device most used, as I understand it, in self-defense purposes, which is what we are sworn to be paying close attention to in our Constitution. The waiting period, if it were all guns, would have, in my eyes, a direct impact on the economic incentive <coughs> that we have for gun show purposes. So I'm glad you're moving in the direction you are. But I'm also now firmly in the camp of this is yet another step. I wasn't there last year. Now I am because of what went on last year. And I think we heard very clearly from Clay Lamson the other day that this was another step in a group that is growing. And that's the concern that I have is that we are taking yet another step on that slope. Um, I wish I could wave a magic wand and have a study as opposed to leaping right into the conclusion that we have a problem. Um, we are essentially abandoning those victims advocates who came to us last year and begged and pleaded that the most dangerous time in a domestic abuse victim's life is those two to five days immediately after a breakup. And now we are placing an impediment in the way of somebody who would choose, I wouldn't recommend it, but if they chose to use this particular device for self-defense purposes and didn't have one, that would be the most critical time for them to get it, would be in the first two days or one day of a breakup. So I'm, I'm really struggling with this because I want to, I understand how you're reaching for compromise, and I appreciate that. I think I still come back to the same place I was before. I don't feel as if there's adequate evidence in front of me that would support the idea. And let me say further that 
the reason for that is the very limited evidence we have in front of us now. <clears throat> it became very clear to me during that conversation with the blacks that in looking back retroactively, they could establish a fairly long period of time, more than the 24 hours that we were suggesting here, in which this individual had formulated the desire and the intent to commit suicide. I know that in the case of my two personal friends, one of whom some of you may know, who belonged to a coffee clutch that I attend every week, we noticed that he hadn't been attending for a couple of weeks. We knew that he had lost his wife and that he was depressed, um, but he didn't wake up one day and decide to go out and buy a handgun. He had guns. Um, that was a lifelong thing for him. In the case of my other friend, uh, a guy that I rode motorcycles with halfway around the North American continent, um, we clearly understood that he had been depressed for a very long period of time. And in his case, too, he had guns throughout his entire life. So I'll throw one other thing in here. Philip, I think you hit the nail on the head when you gave us that anecdote about your daughter. Um, she came home happy-go-lucky and 20 minutes came back downstairs because she had not been invited to something she saw her friends on Facebook had been invited to. I personally have come away from Facebook many times thoroughly depressed about what we are called, what we can't do because we're not smart enough, or the things that we do and we get accused of being elitists. And it literally got to the point where I just said, the hell with it, I, I gotta get off this thing because it's, it's literally just too depressing. And the odd part of it is, Andrew Black was exactly in that situation. And between the texts and the Facebook posts, he clearly was sending out all the signals that were necessary. Would a waiting period have helped him? None of us know. We can't ask him. The odd part of this entire conversation is in a couple of days, we're all going to be talking about a woman's right to choose. And I know this may sound at first blush as if it's coming out of left field, but the fundamental right of an individual to control their bodies and make decisions about their bodies is something I'm very in tune to. And as crazy as this may sound, if I decide to commit suicide, what right does the state of Vermont have to try to intercede? Because somebody around this table feels, well, that's tragic. I'm struggling with this. And I, I come back to saying, I understand you're reaching compromise. I just don't think, unless I can get some evidence in front of me that says, we have a problem in Vermont, and here's the study that demonstrates, say, for a period of months or years or whatever, that we've done this study, X percentage of our suicides have occurred within, say, 24 hours, because somebody went out and bought a handgun, and nobody saw that coming. I think the truth, I really appreciate. I'm with you 99% of the way, Joe. I want to make clear that you know, my evolution on this is the result of what I said last year, that anything that I can do as chair of this committee to reduce what I consider Vermont's gun problem, which is the, lethal, is, so, is the suicide by firearm, I'm going to do. And I remain true to that. And I became convinced during the testimony, both for and against this bill, that this minor step would be able to help reduce, may be able to reduce suicide based upon evidence from a number of people. And I read some of that evidence this morning of, that led me to that conclusion. It wasn't, you know, and I, I hear exactly where you're at. And I didn't come to the, I, on to God, I didn't come to this until uh, two days ago. When it came, when it, it, you know, I finally received enough information for me to say, 
I could support this limited step because I believe, and I can defend it to my constituents, I can defend it to the Senate, that because I believe this will help. Will it's going to solve it? No. And I, I'm not sure that this bill wasn't in the drafting stage before Andrew Black um, committed suicide. Yeah, so, the waiting period concept has been around for a while. Yeah, so I'm not sure that it, I understand that the obituary led much of the discussion here and has opened up, but the issue of suicide by handgun, 90%, 89% according to a VPR study, were the result of uh, firearms over a five-year period. So I think that, you know, I but I don't know that, that the decision was made within 24 hours, 48 hours, 72 hours, or 10 days. California has a 10-day waiting period. Which I would certainly consider, if we did that in Vermont, would probably be unconstitutional based upon the 16th. I agree with you on that point. Let me say first, I am not trying to convince you to change your mind about the decision you've reached based on the evidence you've seen. I come to the point where I say <clears throat> we have a speculative bill that might reduce suicides and that's the hope but it comes at the expense of others we have seen fit to try to protect with legislation that we all worked very hard on and actually got a <coughs> vote out of the Senate as well as the administration in the House I'm sorry um, because we believed the evidence that we were hearing so we had factual evidence in front of us that demonstrated that, that period of time was critical for those people that needed to protect themselves. Now we are using um, our desire to try to correct what is admittedly a problem with suicide, and in my eyes, effectively throwing those people under the bus. Or at least I feel like I'm being thrown under the bus for the amount of work that I put into it. Mm -hmm. Let me um, say one other thing. I have had a lot of emails from folks who are very well intentioned, who have been telling me that guns are the most lethal form of suicide and you don't generally come back. Well, I absolutely agree with that. But I'm not sure I can reach the point where I say my oath to my constitution, at least as I view it, um, tells me that I have to eliminate that from the equation. And the reality is somebody who is using a gun to commit suicide wants to commit suicide. And I just don't believe a happy-go-lucky person on one day wakes up in the morning and says, I'm going out today to buy a gun to kill myself. I absolutely believe after 30, almost 36 years of criminal law, that individuals don't make those kinds of decisions on the impulse of a 24-hour situation. And I guess I'll leave it at that. Alice, did you have a comment? I just, I mean, I think we keep hearing the statistics about suicide. Very sad. But in fact, it's not sad when someone who is suffering from cancer is at the end of their life, decides on their own that they will kill themselves by their own means and decide to shoot themselves. And even though we, we allow people to commit suicide via death with dignity or whatever we call it now, we allow them to do it. And just because someone chooses a different method doesn't mean that that's not their choice to do. And it certainly doesn't, I don't mean that for anything to do with the blacks, but I know older men, several of them, who shot themselves when they were in the last stages of cancer. And they're in the mix of those numbers. And I don't know how many there are every year, but I personally know three men that did that. So, you know, it, it's, it's hard. I mean, suicides are terrible for everybody that's alive. Yeah, take a break. Senator White. So, <clears throat> I've spent a lot of time thinking about this and how they come. Go back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. And, um, I do, I, I do <clears throat> believe that at times suicide is not, it is impulsive. And I, um, one of my best friend's son, who was also one of my best friends, he was 24 and he was the best friend of my son, 
what I saw him in the morning, and he was really happy. He, he was really was a happy kid. He uh, got, he went out that night, and he um, had, it was slippery, and he wrecked his mom's new car, and he was really bummed out about that, and he thought she was gonna yell at him. And, and he went to his very favorite place on Earth, which is the uh, top of a mountain right near my house. And it was a beautiful sunlit January night. The moon was out. And there was a, this little cabin up there on the top of the hill. And there was a rope hanging there. And he hung himself. He, I know that he had not thought about that before. He, he showed no signs to anybody at all. He, um, he was planning. He had just gotten a lot of a bunch of new jobs, all kinds of things. So I don't, th I think there are impulsive suicides and, and I do think that if somebody is in that situation or they are long term, they think about it for a long time, I'm not sure we have a right to tell them that we know best for them. But for the, for the person who, <clears throat> where it is a, an impulse and they are, just so bummed out by whatever it is in this case. It was because he wrecked his mom's new car. And for some reason, that moonlit night up on the hill was, he thought this was the answer. So <clears throat> I do think that um, in those cases, we, if it's by, if we have a short waiting period, it might, I, I believe that if an owl had hooted right then, that he would have been jolted out of that. But I will never know that. I have thought a lot about the victim issue. And I think that one of the things that, because I agreed with you on that for a long time, and I think that one of the things we heard was that if there is a weapon in the house, regardless of who owns it, that um, if the perpetrator comes back, they're more likely to to shoot the the victim if there's a gun in there. So just the fact of the victim going out and getting a gun for self protection may may actually um, be a bad thing because there's now a weapon in there that the perpetrator can use. So I I, I still have mixed feelings about it, but I guess um, and I know I'm going to make everybody angry here. I'm going to make the people that want a longer waiting period angry, and I'm going to make the people who don't want any waiting period. But in the spirit of compromise, I will support the chair. Cool. Uh, I appreciate Joe's um, thinking about victims of sexual violence. And I just want to point out he has a long history of working in the interests of that community. I just wanted to say we did get testimony uh, mailed to us from the Network Against Domestic and Sexual Violence, which is, I think of as the premier group representing survivors. They say, contrary to common misperceptions, access to firearms does not increase victim safety. In fact, proximity to firearms increases the risk of lethality for victims of domestic violence. Firearms are rarely used for self-defense in violent crimes. And they go on to say, domestic violence related homicides forever change the lives of surviving family members and the communities in which they occur. S22 is one way to reduce the likelihood of impulsive acts of devastating violence. We thank the committee for your consideration. Why don't we do the... Oh, I just wanted to ask a question about S22. Yep. We are looking only at the waiting period. Right. We have decided to drop we the believe, safe storage. I believe that the committee was unanimous in okay, that. I was late. Uh, late. Okay. The made the motion that we drop that. But okay, I think I that late. the eye opener for all of us is that we need to educate the public about this. Okay. If you leave, whether it's a bottle of Jack Daniels, firearm loaded or Drano. you know drain out for a young child to get that's a crime in Vermont if you drive drunk 
with it or drugged with a kid in Vermont, that's a crime because you have that those two laws. So I personally find the State Storage Act not only unenforceable, unenforceable, but we already have laws in the book that would cover somebody being negligent with a child. Um, and there's a num number of case laws. There's the case in, I believe it was in Stratton, where the out-of-state family who owned a condo decided to have a, uh, a celebration for their son's graduation from some school and had this huge cake party at the condo, and then they were found to be negligent, not only civilly sued for some damages, but also criminally negligent because of the underage, they were serving underage kids. So I think that, I, I honestly can say I believe that's unnecessary. So I, I think that was the conclusion of the committee, and whoever reports this bill might want to mention that that the committee came to that conclusion. I think that would be at least unanimous, I think. <coughs> yeah, I came in, and I apologize yeah. for coming in late, right. but I, so I just wanted to make sure if that was, because I thought I heard that. Um, we're going to take a break and come back, vote on S-117, give Eric a chance to, to draft some language, and then try to, and vote 117 is the medical marijuana bill. And then, um, well, we, had, we didn't have the language. Michelle was working on some language. And then we'll um, try to finish up this bill by 11.30. Do yes. I was just going to ask Senator too. So is the for now, at least for the next uh, version to look at the committee bill, put uh, S22 as as you propose to amendment right. within that package. Yep. Yeah. Minus and, safe storage. And the safe. Twenty-four. Right. Right. Minus the safe storage and the um, S72 and S1. Yep. And then we'll see what we do. With and Sounds good. Thanks. So okay. you want to hear something very interesting? Do you know where the cannabis bill went in the House? Government operations. <laughs> Makes sense. <laughs> <laughs> I won't, all I know is the definition of a jack <laughs> 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 Do you know if the term handgun is defined anywhere? It is not. And I, what I checked though is that you use the term handgun already without defining it in the large in the magazine section yeah, you last did year. It last year's magazine. Yeah, exactly. Michelle, can you quickly yeah. go through the? It's in your folder. Um, oh, but where's my folder? Right here. Oh, it's underneath that. All right, thank you. Thank you. I don't know what we do with that. Good morning. Good so, morning, Michelle. So for the record, Michelle Childs, Office of Legislative Counsel, and we're taking up amendment to S-117. You have should have a copy of your amendment, draft 1.2. Uh, dated the 14th at 6.15 um, p.m. It just is. Okay. Looks like this. It's adding a section eight. Starts out with the U.S. Food and Drug Administration. Yep, exactly. And so the only amendment that you have to this is really this adding this new section. And I don't think we'll see in the room, but Lucy had come before you and this the, is the, uh, the, the the cannabinoid, yeah, oh, the cannabinoid, cannabinoid tweak. And so what it was is that. Um, <laughs> Yeah, had in previous okay. le right in previous legislation. But I just want to let me just explain to you what I how I did this. No, don't explain. We're all in favor. Okay, but can I just tell you what I'm that I'm? I do you just want to let you know what it's doing, no. not substantively, but just that what it is is that when you had added this language before in previous legislation, it was session law, and and be, and so rather than amending the session law so that you can find it in the future, I codified it. So just so you know, that's why it's underlined. And so it's now going to be in statute in the medical, so you can find it. Okay. That's all. I just want to let you know that. Okay. No. No. Okay, sorry. <laughs> Thanks. Okay. That's it. Okay. Unstoppable. <laughs> okay. So I move that we amend the bill. Amend the bill with 
draft by putting draft 1.2 into the bill. Yeah. New section 8. New, yeah, and new section 8 and 9. Yes. Senator White's move yes. that we uh, add new section 8 and 9 to cover the cannabinoid um, <coughs> prescription drug containing those and repeals in section 9 repeals the other the session law one. Yep. Okay. Mm -hmm. Any dis any discussion of this? Peggy, would you please call the roll? Senator White? Yes. Senator Baruch? Yes. Senator Bay? Yes. Senator Nika? Yes. Senator Sears? Yes. <clears throat> we didn't actually vote on the bill yet, did we? No. Okay, so now I move that we report favorably. S-117 has amended. Okay. Senator Go ahead. Uh, is there any discussion? Yeah. All right, go ahead. <laughs> Senator Wade? Yes. Senator Baru? Yes. Senator Bay? Yes. Senator Nika? Yes. Senator Sears? Yes. You want to report this? Sure. You always do. I know. I'm so lucky to have that. Uh, well, no, I mean, okay. you, no, you've I got, the, you've got the report down. I know. I mean, you've done it 20 times. <laughs> so, Senator White, let me know if I can help you with anything. All right. So, so, let's. Um, <laughs> Until Eric gets back, can we move to the firearms and uh, other S2? S2. Yeah, now I got to find it. I'll be easier to find it on my iPad. Find it in my file. Get full of stuff. What are we going to? S2. Oh, S2. By Senator Rogers. Oh, oh now. I'm actually using yep. my iPad because I can't find it in my. Too many papers in there. We, as introduced, okay. This proposes to limit large capacity ammunition feeding, feeding devices to be transferred from one immediate family member to another by a proxy by a properly executed bill. And so it takes that law regarding the large capacity ammunition devices and would allow you to transfer from one immediate family member. Immediate family member has the same meaning as in section 4019 of this title. So. And that is the step-grandfather Grand, yeah. great grandchildren. It's a silliest. Yeah. So I mean, this is where we could brother. add brother in law or mother in law. <coughs> I know. Sir? I support this. Okay. I would, um, understanding that discussion can follow, I would move that we add it to the committee. Okay. Uh, did you want to add the brother in law? I did. Did you? Want to change it. It. Did you? When? Well, no, I wanted to. You asked me, did I want to? I said, oh, okay, yeah. We need, um, Eric is still typing. Can you handle this? Sure. Um, so we would add to S2, which is the this bill. Do you have a comment? S2. Um, to change the, the definition of immediate family member so that your mother, without it, in. Well, it would have to be in laws. I don't know whether that's is it, what degree of consanguinity or whatever was that term that we used. To, mm -hmm. um, what's your definition now? What's the reference to this it right now? Four this seems to be a third of what type um, degree of consanguinity. Four oh one nine. So, Joe, are you talking about all in-laws? Like if you marry into a family with uh, 30, no, I, I understand there's got to be some break yeah. on it somewhere. What I'm just trying to accomplish is my simple situation where my father-in-law can give me <coughs> that weapon, my brother-in-law can give me his father's weapon. That makes a hell of a lot more sense to me than a great step-grandchild, which is you know, within the definition of so, uh, I don't know, Michelle, how do you word that to parents in law and siblings in law? Right. I want to look at it. I think I covered it. The concept is. 
to having that. Does that sound usable, Michelle? Is it that you would want anybody? Just, <coughs> I'm sorry. So for the um, for the five go through marriage, it would just be, but it would apply to everybody who was in the airport. We have that. We have that right here. Right. Mary has made that right. up. Immediate yeah. family member means a spouse, parent, step parent, child, step child, sibling, step sibling, grandparent, step grandparent, grandchild, step grandchild, grand, grand, <coughs> great grandparent, step great grandparent, great grandchild, and step great grandchild. <laughs> so you would add to that. Um, but are you saying that you would amend this definition, which yes. would apply yes. to yes. everything yes. through the yes. Okay, right. got it. Yeah. So it would cover S13 too. And it would be parents, parents and siblings and siblings in law. And step siblings in law. Yeah, oh, no. <laughs> no, no. Just parents in law and siblings in law. Parents in law and siblings in law, I think would be the term. That had to be one of the worst. Where they ever came up with a great grandchild and step well, great grandchild? Well, I, I, I suspect they came up Similar with it the same way. Somebody had a step yes. grad, great yeah. grandchild that they wanted to be able to. Yeah, that's, I suspect that's okay. how it happened. Something so, tells me the step grand, great grandchild would not be able to hold, much less pick up a weapon because they're so young. But, yeah. but you never know. I don't know. Well, you're still the great grandchild, you want to grow up. My cousin's daughter, <laughs> but married fairly young, she's got about, so my cousin has, I don't know how many great, great grandchildren now, and quite a few. So, yeah, it's all possible. So if you do this, then that would cover the S3 too. That's right. So, um, or S13, excuse me. Yeah. <coughs> So for your information, I have classmates of mine who have great grandchildren. But we're talking about old. step. Well, <clears throat> but they could We're still be the same step. age as, yeah. as my great grandchildren. Your step could be older than you are. Yeah, right. I have. So. Okay. Yeah. That's third. I need that. It can be. Yeah. <laughs> sure it can be. Sure. Okay, so step, um, if you look at S13, which is the other Rogers bill, mm -hmm. it allows for to transfer from one immediate family member to another immediate family member of a large capacity immune ammunition device lawfully possessed on a for the effective date of this section. <coughs> and then he, as used in the subsection, immediate family member shall have the same meaning as. So you would be putting this into the bill too. Yeah. And does anybody have a problem with the S13, which is the transfer from one immediate family member to another capacity, high capacity? The grandfather. The grandfather yeah. magazine, not the not new right. magazine. Yeah. <coughs> and while we're waiting for her to come back, I think I should explain why it is I'm asking for this to the folks who I not understand that. On Thanksgiving, I'm, I never owned a weapon before, but on Thanksgiving, my brother-in-law showed up and he wanted to give to me an antique rifle that his father owned. And we were standing in the garage next to my wife and I had to tell him, Mike, it's Thanksgiving. We're never going to be able to go to find a firearms dealer that's going to be able to do a background check on me right now, so I can't accept this weapon from you. But you can hand it to my wife, who in turn can hand it to me. And that's why we're having this conversation. <laughs> that's what happened. Now I'm a proud owner of a shotgun. But it was given to you by your wife, by, my not wife. by your brother. Not because brother. it would have been illegal for your brother to walk in this way. Thank goodness for your wife. It was a great conversation. Luckily, we were by that time having enough drinks that we had a good chuckle out of it. But that's the way it was. So you want to add parent-in-law and sibling-in-law yes. to yep. this, and what is this going on? Uh, whatever, it's a committee bill that Eric's working on. Okay, so I just have the language here. It's right. easy, and he can just, I'll try to just email it to him. And yeah, yeah, to yeah he drop it into the bill. So, and it's S, but, it, but it's the contents of S2 and S13. Are there, are there other sections of it? 
that we're doing three things. And it's a committee bill. Yeah, it's a committee bill, and we're doing three things. One is adding um, the ability to, through a will, to transfer the large ammunition devices, and through um, transfer to a slightly expanded group of families. To a slightly expanded group of families. <coughs> Huh? Well, <clears throat> um, again, I can't emphasize enough this. If we get it through the Senate, and mm -hmm. largely the pattern mm -hmm. that is going to be written in, we control it, but the end, we don't. We didn't control it last time. So. I think, you know, the government may have a I'm sure he does. Constitutionally speaking. <laughs> Constitutionally speaking. <laughs> I think the Ed ought to be proud of the fact that we now have a new piece of vocabulary in the Senate. Yeah. We tell each other that they're going to house it when they get it. That's your thing. But it actually came up in appropriations yesterday. It came up in our committee too, wasn't it? Yes, that right. Getting housed. Getting housed. <laughs> yeah, we, we used that in the box the other day. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <coughs> In their miscellaneous bill, I think they have a section on alimony laws, which makes this, which would make S99 germane. Or we could send them the bill and let them sit and think about it. I've never been involved in this. I'll stay here and keep it. Well, that was January, that wasn't alimony. This is only spousal. I know you have a strong opinion. Spousal maintenance. This is spousal maintenance. It's not child support or custody or anything else. It's just spousal maintenance, and our laws are dramatic. Well, there's been two two changes. One is the trunk um, action bill. We're going to change uh, the deductibility of alimony payments. So that changed what should be the guidelines. And the number two is that Vermont is way behind other states. Massachusetts did it. We had a lot of testimony last year and the year before on what Massachusetts has done to reform its alimony laws. And, um, there's a little, you know, a testimony from some pretty, you know, People who have been basically impoverished by the requirements of the alimony law. And, you know, they've had to go into their retirement, et cetera. So, we're, we, you know, we have, I don't know what, we may send it out as S99 if we get votes and let them contemplate it over the summer and get pressure on them. Or we can put it as part of another bill. Yeah, um, <laughs> you know, thinking about that, they may not deal with it, so. Yeah, I, whatever, whatever seems best once we hear from people. Well, we can decide once we decide what we want to do, but right. I, I think it's been, there's been a lot of fight about it, um, particularly in the House, to try to amend the alimony statute, the spousal nature. And by the courts. And by the courts. 
Yeah. Who don't want to change anything? Well, they want to control. Take them incredibly long emails. Well, because their stories are just long, long horrendous. Just, but, and it's both men and women. It yeah. isn't. But now the courts are using some of those guidelines they're, that are out there, and that's working much better. They're using they're using the guidelines, but they're still not looking at things like permanent alimony and things like that. That is still in our statutes. Well, that I mean, there needs yeah. to be discretion for the court to, to look at the whole circumstance yeah. and do what they feel is best after hearing everything. Yeah. But the guidelines well, have helped. The guidelines all the have judges. helped some. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> the uh, orange tree. <laughs> So that's for Friday. I need to call. Yeah. I'll call. Yeah. yeah I'll let uh, Peggy know. Like, yeah. You know, she's very demanding. Yeah. I know. You have she, Rich Fleming's contact? Yeah. Sure. Just yeah. let him know and yeah. have him. He'll Rich know that Fleming. people. Rich yeah. Fleming. Yeah. yeah. So ask him for us? Or yeah. Or you only and there is a head of the group, and he'll probably yeah. have, have him. Figure out who should test. Two or three people. Yeah, yeah I was gonna say how many do you yeah, have? Just the kids bring a lot in. No, just two or three. They'll bring a lot in, but yeah. only two or three to test it. Yeah, because we don't have all that much time. Yeah. But we we've been through the issue before. So. Um, we also may take up S seventy four at some point next week. What's seventy four? Those are my guitar thing. That was the bill that the debt collection that oh, yeah, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Wendy Gordon yeah. said everybody is in favor of it. There's no opposition, and then I put it on the schedule in opposition to the bill. Oh. <laughs> I took it off the schedule. So, Joe, have you seen the bill? I meant to bring it in the the um, one that would prohibit racial profiling, which I believe we already do, yeah. prohibit it, so I'm not sure why we need another bill on it. And it would um, <coughs> uh, change the Human Rights Com Commission. Yeah, it is, it? I believe it came in here. I think it's 145. Yeah. No, we was just got it. Was that in the um, yes, reference to the, the House bill? Uh, Remember we got that letter about it really just came the, here. The, that stakeholder thing? No. That's, that's not one of them, I don't think. They're about to celebrate their 30th anniversary. Well, there's a, we just got it yesterday. Okay. Who so, uh, celebrating the 30th anniversary? It, it changes the makeup. Oh, yeah. And it, oh, this is a large capacity. Oh, I gave you 155. Right? Sorry. This one is the one that allows the out-of-state law enforcement officer. Oh yeah, to should yeah, yeah. assist the law, law enforcement officer. We probably add this. As I part was going of that to say bill. we should put that in. You want to read it before you put it in? <coughs> I, I did. I read it the other day. So we um, the uh, an exemption to the um, large capacity is uh, law a law enforcement, and but it doesn't allow. Um, um, out of state law enforcement, for example, if you're in St. Johnsbury and you have somebody from New Hampshire come over, if you're in Brattleboro, it doesn't allow them to to bring in <coughs> to um, right, bring in. yeah, which yeah, doesn't make any case. sense. No, it doesn't. It doesn't make any sense. Law enforcement is law enforcement, and we use mm -hmm. on borders. To, yeah, communities we use and there's out all kind of, state of interstate lot. agreements. But yeah, they can't. Yeah. Oh, well, then we should, add this. we should add. We should add. You add this to Eric's bill. Yeah. Yeah. The whole thing. Yep. What? It's just, it's just it's section. just one section on the back. No, no. One? No. I no. thought it, I thought it should have come to GovOps because it's a board. It. Yeah. Well, first yeah. off, just from my hand, I'll okay. send it to you. It's okay. an executive. I know. Yep. And why would the Speaker of the House, is it a House bill? <laughs> no, it's a Senate bill. It's and it's He's got a whole bunch of odd bills like that. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, why don't you send it to us and we'll take it up when we do the boards and commissions. Uh, I wonder, I wanted to make sure you saw it. I, I don't know where it came from. Okay, should I bring the whole bill up? Okay. Yeah. Sure. And then they got the comp, then they got the bill. Yeah. yeah. 
This is the one thing in the state I think actually works really well. I know, yeah. You know, I, I thought we already had the laws against racial profiling. I think we do. <laughs> well, this creates a new law, a new yes, a new and, it finds, and it finds a police officer who who uses who is found to have used racial profiling. And and to be honest, we all have biases, and we all. Finds them something like five hundred dollars and puts them in jail for two years or something. It makes it up. Okay, that's going in. Thank you. <coughs> Maybe you want to file this before we lose it again. Yeah. <coughs> Somebody getting the other one? <coughs> no, we're taking oh, well, that's going away. Did you know that the Constitution actually mentions suicide? No, what's it say? It says that um, the estates of such persons as may destroy their own lives shall not for that offense be forfeited, but shall descend or ascend in the same manner as if such persons had died in a natural way. Oh, in terms of inheritance. <coughs> uh -huh. So in 1786, that's when that was put. So in a way, it's protecting the, the rights of someone. Family. Or, or actually protecting the family of someone. Yeah. 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 It also says that if you're punished to hard labor, that um, all persons at proper times ought to be permitted to stay at their labor. <laughs> so that's where you get the colorful jumpsuits. And yeah, yeah and working on it. It's a punishment and hard labor, and when you can do it, and that if you do punish somebody by hard labor, it says, uh, and all persons at proper times ought to be permitted to see them at their labor. <laughs> <laughs> to shame them. <laughs> to shame them. Yeah. Thank you for your hard work. Yes, absolutely. We have a bill. We, cer we certainly do. We have a brand new committee bill. Okay. Um, and uh, also thank Michelle for her work on the bill. Yes, thanks. I, th I she wasn't there. I couldn't thank her in person when I walked in the door, but she was emailing me other changes that uh, the committee was deciding on. So I appreciate that. Anybody else? I have two extras. And I have two extras. Yeah. Does Peggy have one? Yeah. Oops, I Does Peggy have one? Yes, I have one. Yes, thank you. I'll post it. Anybody else want one? There's two of them right here. I'll have one. Thank you. Okay. Um, Eric, you want to walk us through this? Yes. So, uh, as I mentioned, this is a, a brand new bill, brand new committee bill from the Senate Committee on Judiciary relating to firearms. It's a combination of some of the other bills we were looking at this morning, as well as a couple of new uh, provisions that are added. Because it uh, has not been proofed or edited yet, I, I know for a fact that there will be typos in there. I'd see one immediately in line five. So <coughs> you know, please do note them as we go through, but also know that it hasn't been proofed or edited yet. So it wouldn't be unusual to see some. Appreciate your hard work. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Senator. Um, but as we were discussing earlier, we also had a chance to talk with John Boomer about this and voting it out today is going to be fine. It doesn't necessarily have to be proof edited by the end of the day today. Yeah. Um, it'll be fine to be introduced on Tuesday. Well, if the House decides to technically not take it up because of a little detail, I'm sure it'll be enough for us to it. I actually uh, let people know that this might not make it technically on the process. All right, so should we look at what the different provisions are within the, within the, <coughs> right, oh, within the, sorry, within the new committee bill? So the first one has to do with the uh, large capacity ammunition feeding devices. There are a couple of different pieces in here. You'll see, though, that the first two uh, sections are not actually changed at all. I only put them in there because I think Senator Ruth had mentioned earlier it was helpful to sort of understand the lay of the land a little bit as to what's being amended. So you see the first subsection A is just the prohibition that you passed last year. Generally speaking, uh, the large capacity ammunition feeding devices are prohibited. Um, subsection C is uh, the grandfathering 
provision. Everybody remember that from last year. So if you possessed one uh, on or before the effective date of that section, which was April 11th, 2018, that was the day the governor signed it. So if you possessed it on or before that date, then uh, you can continue to possess it. You're not prohibited by the new statute. But you could also buy it up until October 1st. That's right. There was a provision in there that allowed dealers to sell their existing inventory until October 1st. Yeah. So that's the uh, way the existing statute works as well. There are these exceptions in the existing law that you passed last year. And the two provisions that you see on page two both modify these existing exceptions a little bit. So one of the exceptions, and this is from uh, the first one you see on line 7 to 15, that was, I think it was S-155 that was right. uh, introduced yeah. by Senator Rogers and I think Senator Parent as well. Yes. Um, so uh, that provision is now here in the committee bill and that uh, uh, basically involves, uh, you see there was an existing exception last year so that if, uh, if the device was transferred to or possessed by a law enforcement officer, uh, for legitimate law enforcement purposes, well, there was an exception for that. So uh, I think the situation came up, and that's what you see addressed in lines 11 to 15, is what about situations where um, a, an out-of-state law enforcement officer has been called to assist a Vermont law enforcement officer uh, in state. And so this addresses that situation and adds that to the exception so that uh, if that circumstance unfolds, that an out-of-state law enforcement officer um, is called into Vermont for legitimate law enforcement purposes, then that possession is also exempt. Okay. Yep. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yep. All right. We all, so that, we all approved that while you were, while Michelle was. Oh, even better. So, yeah, <laughs> okay. it. Number two, I just got, do um, you want to go to little II? On, which was S1? Yes, right. Yes, so this was S1. You see the bottom of page two. Yep. This is the shooting competition issue. Remember organized. That? Yes, organized, thank you. So you see that on line 18, the word established has changed to organized. So that, again, this is an, an exception uh, that the, mm -hmm. uh, these devices aren't prohibited. They're, remember, they're transferred, or transported, rather, mm -hmm. by a resident of another state into Vermont for purposes of what was an established shooting competition. And after some testimony this morning, uh, that's been changed to organized shooting competition. Yep. Um, so that's a slight change to the existing one. Then you've also added that that number applies only to out-of-state residents, right? Transported, so an out-of-state resident transport, uh, transports the device into Vermont. There was discussion this morning of, well, what about a Vermont resident? Could they use one at one of these shooting competitions? And that's what subdivision little ii, so that Roman numeral two there addresses, lines 20 and 21. Shouldn't that be October 1st? September uh, 30th? Because it was legal to purchase the <laughs> Uh, no, possession, the, possession though, the, the grandfathering of the possession uh, happened on April 11th. So that's okay. true that, that the uh, um, dealers could sell their inventory by October 1st. The reason 1st. I'm cognizant of that is that the charges against Max Mission in Bennington are that he possessed, he, he had, the Bennington police investigated and determined he had purchased the high capacity magazines before October 1st. And they felt that that was not a violation of the law, but a violation of the law that the Attorney General in further investigation found that he had bought some in December in New Hampshire, and that made that a violation of the law. So I'm just curious if the April, if we should change the April 11th date to um, September 29th or something I, like that. I think, and correct me if I'm wrong here, don't we use April 11th all the way through? I don't think other than because they purchased them, a Vermont resident purchased them in the interim, or were given them, and that was legal until October 1st. And that's when the new law took effect. I don't think that the, uh, if you look back, I mean, you may not have this provision in the language in front of you. I do have that provision. You have C2? Provided it was. Unfortunately, see too much in there. But uh, the prohibition on possession, transfer, sale, and purchase of large capacity, uh, I mean, ammunition feeding devices, does not apply to a device lawfully possessed by a dealer prior to ele April 11, 2018, and transferred on or before October 1st. Well, it's always. So, <coughs> yeah, but. So you okay, could buy so, it by October 1st. I mean, did the Bennington police then make a mistake? What? 
or is the confusion with the law that we should correct? <laughs> I mean, I, we can pass this out and then yeah. do an amendment to correct that, but could you research that yeah. on Monday and Tuesday? Yeah, definitely. Um, because I really want to get this piece right, and I don't think we have it right. Or at the very least, we have confusion if the Bennington police investigated the case and believed that there was no violation of the law in the state. I believe that the state's attorney agreed with the Bennington police on this case. And it's the only case I know of where this has come to light. Right, because it says it could be transferred by the dealer right. before October 1st. Right. So it, it has to be transferred to somebody. Right. But they can sell it to out-of-staters. I think well, let's, let's, let's just, let's let's just, just, ask, let's just yeah. Eric, okay. ask Eric to research it. Leave the uh, April 11th date there. A August, April 11th date. Yep. But then, with the idea that we may need to amend it on the floor after Eric has researched it because Obviously, one way or the other, it needs to be clarified whether or not somebody violated the law. And it's, and it's the only case I know of where this yeah. charges have been brought on this. Yeah, that makes sense. I'll look at it more. Uh, you might check with Erica Mathage on, on the yeah. Bennington case I will, I'll give and her. how they concluded their, that the purchase was legal. Yeah, Joe. I, I don't know. I, I would have put a period right after the word competition on line 20. This is not about whether or not they purchase something at a given point in time. The question is whether they are at a shooting competition mm -hmm. and they're in possession of it. I don't understand why we have that last line in there. Well, that was my objection. If we don't have that in there, we're not talking about grandfather weapons. We'd be talking about right. um, other other possibilities. So I'm, I'm, I thought we had agreement to yeah. go with this. Yeah. It was lawfully possessed by somebody, not necessarily by the participant, I think. So the, the, the owner of the shooting contest could have lawfully possessed it and let, or John Rogers could lawfully have possessed it and let Sears use it. My understanding of the nature of the bill request <laughs> mm -hmm. was that shooting competitions could be held mm -hmm. and the Vermonters would not be at a disadvantage. Right, right. I think they're okay. Because they can borrow, they have, they're going to have to borrow it or something. Well, that's yeah. another part of the problem. If you go to a shooting range and John Rogers is there with his high-capacity magazine, you don't own one. You can borrow his. You can He's borrow using. his, but it's he that had possession of it legally prior to the date. Yes. Dick did not. Technically, that's a transfer at that point in time. No, but this legalizes the ability, as long as the magazine was lawfully possessed on or before that date, you can, if you're at a shooting competition, let somebody use it. Okay, let's let's kind of let's let's let Eric research okay. this. Uh, I think yeah. we know what we want. Uh, we need to make sure. Yeah. Mr. Chair, I I took your point on the on the day. You say that. I, I'm hoping we won't <laughs> say things like this to to vote it out and then decide to revote later. No, I'm not. Okay. I'm, I'm supportive of your of little I.I. I. Yes. My only question is the date. I, I see that. That's the only question I'm asking. I was here speaking to the judge. judge. I thought, yeah. No, I think. Can, can I just quickly make another observation? Line 19. If the device is lawfully possessed under Vermont law or the laws of another state, I think would resolve okay. the question. Yep. All right. That's. But, we don't, we don't need that because that's what it says now. But you're technically bringing in a date there which suggests somebody can investigate whether or not on the scene. I'm, I'm struggling but, with why that language But adding necessary. under Vermont law wouldn't change that. It would still, correct me if I'm wrong, Eric, under Vermont law, which we are amending in the in little ii, we're still talking about what's legal under Vermont's law, and then we're making a, a slight exception. So adding the words under Vermont law, we just restate what's already obvious, which is that this is Vermont law. Yes. OK, let's, can we move on, please? Section 2. Section 2 is also, I think, Senator Sears, based on what I heard from Michelle, something that the committee 
discussed a short while ago while I was upstairs doing redrafting. This has to do with yep. um, when a background check is required and remember there's an exemption for transfers between right. family members yep. and it's adding in line uh, seven, two different uh, types of family relationships to the right. list of family relationships. This would that, allow Joe's brother to give him the gun directly rather than going through his wife. Yes, exactly. Mm -hmm. okay. Section. Uh, Three. Section three is the waiting period. <coughs> you see now that it's handgun transfers. It's not uh, does not apply to all firearms, and it's a 24-hour waiting period. So the prohibition is on uh, transferring a handgun to another person until 24 hours after the completion of the background check required by either federal law or state law. So once the background check is complete, there's a 24-hour waiting period. There's a uh, $500 misdemeanor. You see it in lines 15 through 17, and again, uh, just sort of clarification, but subsection C makes it doubly clear that the section does not apply to a handgun transfer. It does not require a background check. Again, so it sort of it goes back up to immediate family. Exactly. <coughs> yep. Or if there's, remember, I think if you remember, the, the transfer or has to be, fire. or handing it to your friend, because transfer yeah. requires a transfer of ownership, if I remember correctly. Yep. So, right. um, so those things would not require a background check, and therefore would not require a waiting period like either. Okay. Yep. Any questions? All right. Section four is uh, the ERPO, the Emergency Risk Protection Order provision. Okay. This is uh, really unchanged from what you saw this morning. Again, this is the provision over on page four that permits a health care provider to provide information to a law enforcement officer uh, when they think this person causes an extreme risk of harm and to do that without violating HIPAA. That's basically the gist of what's going on there. <clears throat> Okay. Section 5 is the reporting, uh, also unchanged from what we saw this morning. This is the court administrator and the Agency of Human Services reporting to the Judiciary Committees on data regarding these ERPO orders, uh, as well as uh, follow-up data on their renewal and whether the person's charged with violating them. And then Human Services is also supposed to report back on uh, any connection between ERPOs and suicide rates. Yep. That's exactly what we approved earlier? Yep. That's section section six, six is repeal of the, the shooting range? Yep, repeal of the shooting range sunset. Uh, remember oh, shooting competition. Right. Shooting competition, thank you, sorry. Um, and so now it's controlled by what we're adding. Exactly. Yeah. Section uh, right. right. So part two. Yep. Yeah, right. Section five. So it doesn't go away, it doesn't sunset, and what you have is then been proposed to be uh, amended by uh, Section one of the bill. Is there any discussion? Uh, understanding that discussion can follow, I would. Um, I'm pleased with this, and I think it it hits both sides in positive ways. So I would I would move that we um, pass this out favorably. Senator Baruth has moved that we pass it favorably with the agreement that there may be an amendment to line 21. On page two, which is the date of April 11th, it could be uh, September, 20, September 30, um, rather than April 11th, because there's confusion about about that. Uh, Senator White, are you taking comments right now? Sure. <clears throat> so I am supporting this, and I think that you did a, a good job of trying to do something that meets the needs without going farther than some people would have liked and not as far as other people would have liked. But I, I have to say that, <clears throat> that I'm reading 4021 of Title 13, and I think I'm going to echo what Alice said earlier <clears throat> about the faith in the system. And when I read this whole thing, it, I believe, is what people mean when they say making sausage. Because this is the, I, I'm just going to say it. I think this is the worst piece of legislation we've ever passed. It is confusing. It's hard to read. It, and you're talking uh, about the magazine. I'm talking about just this this one section here about the magazines because I think it's contradictory within itself. It's hard to understand. Just the two conversations we've had this morning about the dates <coughs> and whether. Uh, Vermonters are at a disadvantage. <coughs> the whole thing, I think, was done on the fly without the um, 
benefit of having gone through any committee, and I think it is a horrible piece of legislation, and I, for one, hope it's struck down. It's not poorly written. Huh? It's not poorly written. I was going to say. Poorly, <laughs> no, it's, <laughs> no, it's not poorly written. It's, it's, it's poor, the, the, the concepts The direction are, to the legislative council is poorly conceived. Yes, <laughs> yes. It was, the writing of it was really good, but the concepts behind it are, I just, I mean, we've had more discussion about how to interpret this in this conversation than, would, than we've had about a waiting period. So anyway, so would, that's my. I, I, I would totally agree with you, um, <coughs> as you know, and I, I've never supported the magazine restriction. And I also hope it's struck down, but if it isn't, I think there are enough, probably enough votes in here to ask to repeal it, but I am uncomfortable with voting to repeal something that is before the courts. I mean, it is, we do have an executive, a legislative, and a judicial branch, and right now that portion of the bill is in the judicial uh, branch, and I think it would be not, it would be un probably unconstitutional for us to, or at the very least, <coughs> not a good idea for us mm -hmm. to be interfering with what the judicial branch might decide. And to see my own remarks used in the case against Max Mish is, uh, is even more. <coughs> Are there any other comments? Peggy, could you please call the roll on yep. Senator Bruce's motion to approve uh, <coughs> section X. <coughs> The draft dated 315-2019, draft 1.1 1 .1 at 1018 a.m. Senator White? Yes. Senator Baruch? Yes. Senator Denny? No. Senator Nika? No, with explanation. Senator Sears? Yes. Senator Nika? Uh, so I'm voting no on this bill. I think it's I think it is a good bill. It corrects a lot of things and does a few things that are I think would be very good. But given the um, given the future of this bill in the Senate and the House, I can't support it because it's too risky in terms of other things that might be amended. <coughs> I'd also like to add that I do appreciate the committee's work. I think it is very valid attempt at trying to reach compromise and I don't want to leave people with the impression that I'm somehow angry with the committee because I think the committee worked very hard to reach consensus. I'd like to thank every member of this committee. I'd also like to thank people <laughs> on both sides of the issue of so-called gun control, whether they be gun sense, whether they be um, the Gifford Center, whether they be the Center of Vermont, whether they be the NRA any uh, Vermont Federation of Sportsmen Clubs. They have been so respectful and so uh, actually uh, helped us in our decision making. And I do appreciate every one of you, uh, particularly the, the public hearing in Randolph, and I real, realized it was a sea of orange, but the people there, by and large, were extremely respectful of our process and made me proud to be the chair of this committee and to see this process work. This truly is compromise. It's too bad Washington can't do things like this. Um, we have something here, I think, for everybody to like and something here for everybody to dislike. Um, I realize that the waiting periods are problematic. Um, I think that trying to fix last year's mess on the magazines at least we're attempting to pr at least allow shooting contests and other um, efforts to continue and not to be banned. Also trying to correct some of the mistakes and who can transfer and who can will and how you can deal with those things. So I think there's, you know, a balanced bill. I, I don't know what will happen, but I promise you all I'm going to do everything I can to make sure that it doesn't get housed. <laughs> Thank you. All right, we're adjourned. Thanks all.